Megan, lovely to meet you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Lovely to meet you as well. And thank you for having me on today. Oh, it, it's an absolute pleasure. Where about are you based? I am based in very dry, landlocked Colorado, USA right now. Uh, I'm from the Florida Keys, though, so that's my, my ocean and diving background stems from way back. My watery roots run deep. I was just looking um, through your website and stuff about you, and um, I'm a bit humbled. I mean, <laughs> I've done a lot. I, I almost <laughs> feel like I've wasted half my life. I mean, it's extraordinary the amount of things that you've done. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. That's, that's quite the compliment. Yes, my, my background has been very watery and eclectic. It's a, it's a very eclectic mix of different hats that I've worn throughout my, my water-based work. For sure. Can we start off um, just your new project? Uh, at least I think it's your latest project, uh, the Imperfect Conservationist series. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, this is really the first initiative um, of the direction that I'm going with my, my branding and business. And this is the voice of my life of my career of everything that um you know that i've been working for throughout um all of my water work over the past two decades and really so it's the imperfect conservationist and it is a web series all geared at the ultimate goal of positive ocean impact so the based on the idea that everything is so connected and we you know as people living up on land we have an impact on everything around us and it all runs to the ocean. So as divers, we get to be on the front lines of seeing the, the impact, uh, you know, that we have as humans and on the environment. And, you know, as divers, we are such stewards for the environment to come back. We're, we're you so uniquely positioned to come back from, from our underwater world and relay that. And so really all of these things together, my background in production, my and uh, on camera work and as a free diver and ocean advocate for so long. Um, this is the like bringing all of these things together for this project, the imperfect conservationist. And really what it, what it boils down to is easy money saving and impactful conservation for everyone that you can bake these things, these little tiny adjustments into your everyday life. So they become habit. So you're, it's like the backdrop. You kind of forget you're doing them. And what the beauty of it is that there's these things are so small that they almost seem like they don't make a difference. Like they're so insignificant, but that's what makes them sustainable. And what I bring in the series is the, the under, help bring the understanding of how they are hugely impactful. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really exciting. I'm, I'm just stoked to have it launched and out there and to be talking about it. So thanks for having me on to today specifically to talk about that too. How many programs have gone out so far? I have two episodes out already and uh, coming up on the third this week and they're gonna this is the pilot season so there's gonna be seven episodes and I have um, this will be the third one coming out this week like I said and I also have an introduction video it's just called the imperfect conservationist explained so that you can kind of get a real good idea of what it brings and it um, it's all kind of built around the concept of conservation empowerment and this is coming from a lot of my personal experience working in the field of marine conservation for so long now and really feeling the and being impacted by the overwhelm of all of it, whether it's the bad news that's coming at us from every direction having to do with the environment or even the volume of material out there to go big, right? Like the feeling that you have to do it all and do it perfectly, or it almost becomes this 
becomes paralyzing where it's like, ah, oh, I can't, I can't fix climate change myself. So I'm just, I, I can't do anything. You know, if I can't do it all, I can't do anything. And it's really the, the idea of conservation empowerment is really to overcome this. It's the, un, it's developing this understanding of what and how you can do, you know, what you can do as an individual right now to make an impact, a positive impact on the world around you. Have you had any feedback yet um, of any sort at all from, from viewers, Absolutely. Fans, friends, businesses? Yes, all of the above. So, so you know, I look to my my family and close friends for the the most you know hard critique always. But I've gotten really good feedback across the board um, from family and friends that uh, have given me like tweaks to make and and um, just you know little adjustments along the way. I've gotten great feedback from the public so far. Uh, my numbers are going up, up, up. I've had. Uh, huge increases on, you know, subscriptions and follows and comments and engagement and all of that. So that's excellent. And I also have been speaking with a variety of, of you know, potential collaborators and uh, to bring on the show as individuals who are experts in their own field and will really help bring that collaborative nature to it because I really want this to my, you know, the full intention is to have this be a, a resource, a conservation minded resource that empowers all of us to just do these, these small sustainable actions and, and build that into our lifestyle. And I want it to, and you know, it's being built to infuse every, every uh, industry and walk of life essentially that we, that we can. And so I have a bunch of individuals that are going to be coming on the show um, from, you know, kind of figureheads in their own right of different industries. And also, um, yeah, I've been getting great feedback from companies as well uh, within, you know, the different realms that I kind of uh, uh, that are in my sphere with the dive industry and conservation and uh, adventure and outdoors. So Coming along, come along, building everything as I go, but it's been really energizing and really exciting feedback so far. <laughs> well, I'm excited just by your excitement. I mean, it's Thanks, I know, I get excited about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing it. As I said, the only thing we've seen so far is that little introduction film. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up on it. With, uh, with your audience. Oh, yeah, please do. Ah, well, with your audiences, do you have any idea of age groups i mean who, who's more receptive to what you're saying it, can you tell what age groups are uh well so i'm just starting to you know take in those numbers now um as as i'm going into i have two episodes launched so or you know out there posted so far and as i go i'll be able to collect more of those numbers but you know the my I, I like to say that it's literally, you know, for everybody ranging all span, but, but ideally and, and realistically, this is targeted at the, basically the decision maker in the home. So, you know, statistically and, and everything, um, my target audience is going to be the decision maker in the home ranging from ages, you know, 25 to about 52. And like I said, I'm starting to collect those numbers in, but, but really conservation, we all live here. We share this blue planet. And so it applies to everybody. So much of it is tied though to, our consumer choices, uh, you know, meaning so much of our impact on the world around us is tied to our consumer choices and our, cons you know, just our consumption in life in general. Um, and so that's where that demographic comes in of, of being like the decision maker and the purchaser in the home. Yeah. You lecture a lot in schools, colleges, universities. Say, say that again. I didn't hear you. Do you lecture? Quite a bit. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, I do. So, so pre-COVID, I was traveling quite a bit for public speaking engagements and, and um, you know, keynote, uh, key, being a keynote speaker and doing different, really fun and exciting, everything from, you know, school age kids, like down as young as, as preschool and kindergarten, all the way up to universities and, and doing the, the circuit with everybody. It's, I really enjoy that type of work. But with it, with the younger audiences, uh, what kind of feedback are you getting there? Um, 
I always find younger people are more interested in the environment than the older people who kind of sit back there, you know, we've lived through it, this isn't going to affect us, et cetera, et cetera. But the influence of kids on parents is not to be ignored um, and their peers. Are you finding that as well? Absolutely. So I, I have been with, with this specific web series, The Imperfect Conservationist, this is geared for adults. This one is not for kids, but I do have plans to expand that um, even in written form and things like that to uh, further engage kids and give them uh, some of these, these tools in a very you know, bite-sized way as well. And I have a, I have a seven-year-old, he's almost eight. And so he's, he, I, you know, I test things on him and thing, and he gives me great feedback. And I've spoken at his school different times throughout, throughout his, uh, his preschool and kindergarten and whatnot. And, you know, I, I totally believe that, um, yes, that, and, and I know from my own experience that kids have huge influence over their parents. And I speak uh, frequently to uh, at the Ocean First Institute. This year it was online, but they have marine science camps and, and specifically uh, young, young ladies uh, marine science summer camp as well. And I always do a talk with them. And I stress that all the time when I'm speaking with kids. It's like, look. I can tell you, you have huge influence over your parents and this is your superpower and this is how you can activate that. And, and really that, again, that conservation empowerment. And yes, I agree exactly with what you said that, you know, they have a huge influence over their parents. They are very energized. And I think that there is that, you know, that is the biggest difference with kids versus, you know, the older generations is that they are they are so engaged and so energized and, and tend to be optimistic in a very realistic way. So when the, when the situation calls for them to be, you know, you, I'm sure, you know, that you've seen all the climate strike things and, and Greta Thunberg and, and the difference. So when the, when the situation calls for, you know, tough talk and, and direct action, we're seeing, you know, the younger generations getting so involved and that is inspiring to me. And I'm sure so many other people to see that energy getting, you know, infused into this activism environment. And, and I love, um, and, and it, that is the biggest difference between like the older generations and the, the upcoming generations now is just that it, it feels like, there's more of that that optimism and action based optimism, if that makes sense, as opposed to just like, oh, there's still hope and there's all this. Well, it's like you know the time for for hope. Like we want to keep hope because that is a good catalyst to taking action. But it's t it's time for action, and so that's really uh, you know this this conservation this idea of conservation empowerment is landing in that empowered middle ground. So you're not you know, over here, ignorance is bliss, pretending nothing's wrong. And you're not over here on the other side where you're just paralyzed. And I think that our younger generations are really finding that middle ground a lot better than I think we often are able to do just because, um, well, who knows? I mean, every situation is different, but I think it's important to feel that, that in empowerment so that you can take action. Yeah, I mean the thing with with kids is their minds are still open. They they've not become jaded by life, and so they're much more willing to take news in and analyze it, um, because they've still got the whole future ahead of them, and it and it's it's life, and um, it's really sad. I find that the older people tend to ignore that to some degree. It's a great shame. But um, I'm glad you're looking at kids because I think that's an important part. And you have kids. Oh, you have a boy. One boy. Yep. Yep. Eight, one. Eight, eight years old. Yep. He's going to be eight coming up this, this next week. Oh, or no, this week. Oh, my gosh. At the end of this week. Oh, holy smokes. <laughs> and, it happens so fast. It goes. It's just... uh, I, I, yeah. No. I have two grandchildren, two granddaughters. And, uh, oh, well, you know, what happened? We're, we're, where did you yeah. go? Yeah. Yep. Is your boy learning fast. to dive? 
Yes, he is. Uh-huh. We actually, he's my, he's my best and most favorite dive buddy ever. So he's just getting to the age where he'll be able to do scuba and, and he's expressed some interest in that, but he's been free diving since he was very little. Uh, he started, he could snorkel before he could swim. I'll put it that way. Cause he would put on the mask and the snorkel and he would forget he, you know, didn't know how to swim yet. And so he would just tool around and all of that. And then, so that was kind of how we learned how to swim. And uh, we, God, he's, he's such a little fish. And I just let him take the reins, you know, like I don't, I, I, I'm very fearful that he's going to rebel against it. So I'm like, whatever you want to do, it's great. And I just play, you know, I'm trying to play it really mom cool. So it's like no pressure, but he, at six, he was free diving to 15 feet already and just on his own accord, you know, and we'd be out together, of course, and, and all of that. And we were on this amazing trip uh, with Weaver's Dive and Travel here out of Colorado. It's my, my buddy is Steve Weaver who owns that. And we went on this amazing trip to St. Lucia and we were down there and it was just, it was such a magical trip. And I let him completely take the reins, like I said, with our diving. Cause you know, we, there were so many different things you could do that. And we had option to dive every day. And there were like three different night dives. And I was like, what do you want to do today, buddy? And he's like, I want to go diving. And I was, he was like waterlogging me where I was like, are you sure? Like I just dried, I just dried off, you know, but he had us on three night dives and we were free diving the whole time, of course, but we went on three night dives. He was so, he's like the bravest soul I've ever met. He just, he was having such an amazing time. And, and I was just uh, marveling at experiencing this stuff through his eyes. Like it was the first time again for me, it was just mind blowing. Kids are so cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. What's his name? Cash. Cash. I like Cash. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Keep Cash is, but he goes by Cash. <laughs> yeah, he's my little fish. Hey. Out of uh, all the all the your time that you've been in with the ocean, um, what are the greatest changes that that you've noticed? Ooh. Well, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up in the Florida Keys. And that's my home reef. Like no matter where I go in the world, no matter where I've dove, no matter where I live, I always have one fin back home in the Keys. And it's, uh, it's changed so much underwater there that I have found myself, you know, especially, you know, taking my son snorkeling like his first trip there and his first time in the ocean he was four months old and we've been traveling back regularly ever since and so he's really gotten accustomed to to you know viewing it through a mask with me and that was that was really when I started to notice the biggest changes like I've seen them all along but it was just kind of like you know, that getting hit by a semi when I was showing it to my son and seeing it over again because I kept, I realized that I kept saying to him, well, bud, when mommy was a little girl, this was like this. And bud, well, yeah, it's because he'd say, he'd snorkel talk, right? Like, mom, it's so beautiful. Ah, he's all excited talking through his snorkel. And I just kept feeling compelled to say, yeah, it, it is, it is, but it's all the brown green algae so it's not like dead it's just not alive with what it's supposed to be alive with and the fish aren't as plentiful and the corals are you know we're, we're struggling very badly with the stony coral disease down in the keys right now and like literally on my home reef at, at Lou Key um, the the sanctuary out there and 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 all over I mean it's spreading throughout the Caribbean but um that was when that that was the biggest difference that I I've I think it was my aha it was it was my aha moment and it was on a specific trip uh, even after all this time because he was be, he was coming to a level of awareness at his age and it was it was the summer of 2019 in particular that I really recall and it just I was explaining to him what live rock was and what the flats looked like when I was a little girl and what the wall of the boat basin looked like when I was a little girl. And not even, not even that long ago, you know, but I've witnessed um, 
multiple die-offs in the boat basin and the, the overgrowth of the sargasm seaweed and really started digging into some of these issues when I was, you know, I'm living in Colorado and then I would fly, you know, fly home and, and visit when I, whenever I could. And so it was kind of interesting. It's, um, it, it's kind of like in the opposite direction when you can see kids grow and it's almost more dramatic if you don't see them, you know, it's like, oh my God, you were, you're so much taller now. And it's like, I've seen the, the degradation of, of my home waters in that, in reverse like that. So because I was just kind of, you know, coming in and out and seeing the changes in the water. So anyway, it's, it's terribly sad. And, it, and these are the, the rabbit holes that we can go down, especially in the field of, of conservation in general, whether it's on land or in the sea and the connectivity of all of it. Um, it, it all impacts, you know, itself and each other. And those are the rabbit holes that we can go down. And, you know, something I really stress in this the web series, The Imperfect Conservationist, is that, look, it's, it's so important to have an understanding of the problem, but you cannot get stuck there. You've got to move on from that because that is what, it, that's what brings us to the point of, of action. And that in itself is empowerment that like, okay, so I got the problem. This sucks. This is, a, this is bigger than I can handle myself. But you bring it back down to right here, what's right in front of you. And it's like, now we're going to switch from the problem to the solution. Let's start getting the creativity going. And that's where, especially where the kids come in, you know, it's like, let's get this creativity going. Let's look at it in a new way and then look at what I can do right now, right today to actually make an impact. And you can feel like it's so small, but when you start hearing the numbers, it's not small and all the, it's the drops in the bucket, which eventually, you know, move mountains and carve through stone, right? Like water is so, it's, it's just, uh, it's what connects everything in the conservation world too. But I, I think it's really, um, yeah, I'm trying to circle back around to the original question, but I kind of went all over. That's what I do. I'm like water. When I talk, I just flow and I go. <laughs> That's right. That saves me asking lots of questions. Oh, there better. you go. <laughs> Do you know, one of, one of the hardest things I find to do is if I'm diving with younger people and if it's an area not, I know that I've known my life or over many years and they get to see something, they may see a turtle. They'll tell me this is the best spot in the whole area and then we'll get to see a turtle or a fish or maybe a uh, maybe a, a, an angler or something and they're so excited and in my head I'm screaming you know 10 15 years ago you would have seen 20 turtles here right and I can't tell them because at least I can't tell them in the way that it's you should have seen it when I was young so you have to be and as you're saying you have to be so delicate and careful how you put that information across. Because otherwise they just lose interest. They say, oh, well, it's all gone. You know, what can we do? Right. I think, and that, that's for all of us, I think, you know, mm. that, that it, it can be so, it, there's so many ways to, to approach things, right? I always say there's, there's more than one way to crack this nut. And so you, you figure out, like, I always try and, lead with something that's positive and, and not even lead with, I just try and keep things positive because, you know, the, the alternative doesn't motivate anybody. And it's, in fact, it's, it's the exact opposite, which, you know, you get inundated with the bad news and the numbers and it can feel like it's all like you have no control over it. Like you, you have no, you know, ability to impact any any of it and and in any way other than negatively and you know we get to i love the jane goodall quote that and i'm i'm not good at repeating quotes so it's not verbatim but <laughs> but basically it's that every every day you know we have an impact on the world and we get to choose what kind of an impact that is it can either be positive or negative and mind you we didn't get here where we're at with the environment and the state of our, our world by like 
big sweeping movements. This was bit by bit, choice by choice. And we all have an impact on that. We all have an impact on how we got here. And you can undo that. I, I went through, I love, I love to do carpentry and plumbing and like all this stuff. It's kind of like my side. It's like DIY therapy. I call it, you know, I love to like do house projects and whatever. And Back in 2005, we got hit so hard uh, by the hurricanes down in the Keys. And the last one was Wilma and it just, it flooded everything. I had some, you know, rentals and stuff like that just on my little property that I, that I had tenants in and stuff. And I spent two years tearing that apart and putting it back together. And I, I would run into challenges and it was like, you know, whatever it was, I was trying to take a part that seemed impossible. And it's like, man, if it was put together, it can be dismantled. And if it was dismantled, it can be put back together. And I often will go back to that mindset when I'm thinking of conservation and, and how we, it's not just like, oh, I have, I'm, it's just me. I can't save the world by myself, you know, and, and have that impact me in a negative way where, where I'm, you know, disempowered and feeling small and all of that. It's like that mindset of like, we understanding those components of how we got here, which was bit by bit, and then we can get out of it too. And we're positioned right now in this time and space with more technology advancements, more not, you know, knowledge and understanding of what the problems are. Like no other generation or space and time has understood the problems like we do now, right now. And knowledge is always power. Like, I don't care what topic it's about, knowledge is power because when you understand it, you can't unknow things. I had a professor that always used to say that. He was dealing with some, it was a um, physical anthropology class I, I had. And he was my favorite professor. And he would talk on some really heavy topics just about our, our history, the, right? The history of being human and how we got here and how we evolved, all this stuff. Some serious heavy topics. And he'd say, you know, he would get so passionate about it. And it was like, it stuck with me because you can't unknow it. You know, like ignorance is bliss, but then when you know it, you can't just pretend it's not happening anymore. And so then you get this, you get all these tools in your toolbox to become you know, the impact that you choose to be, because now, you know, now you understand the problems and you know, you know, like, and all these components start coming together and boom, voila, you have the imperfect conservationist because man, none of us are perfect. I can't save the world by myself, but I'm going to do everything in my power to do what I can. And that's all, you know, and that's all we can each do. And so anyway, it just kind of all, you know, it's all the ingredients that come together for the imperfect conservationist, which is me and you and everybody who cares. Yeah, excellent. When I, when I go away and to wherever it is, land, diving, see whatever, and I come home, there's one view. And driving from the airport, I come down the middle of Cornwall and it's all land. And then I come over this one hill and there in front of me is Penzance Bay. And every time, even after all these years, it makes my heart flutter. <laughs> well, I'm here again, I'm home and here's the sea. Does the sea still excite you? Does it, does it oh still make God. you do that? You know, when you see it? I love that story. Yes. That's very relatable for me. Um, when I, I got to, we road trip, my son and I road trip to Florida from Colorado this, this last summer. And when I got to see the ocean, you know, af after the impact of COVID and all the stuff that we were just kind of, who knew we were just, you know, scratching the surface back this last summer of the long haul we were in for, but it was, um, Yes, it was every time I, I get to go home to the sea, no matter where it is, but especially in the Keys, because like I said, that's my home reef. But, uh, you know, it, it always has that impact on me. I mean, it'll move me to tears. And I, I, um, I just feel this, this incredibly deep and spiritual connection to the ocean. And I love sharing that with my son. So that just even makes it 
takes it that's that's like a huge level up when i get to go and and see the ocean again for the first time and and be there and get in and uh just all of it and you know back back home in the keys it's funny uh there's this very distinct smell of rotting turtle grass which if you've lived by the ocean i'm sure you have your own flavor you know of that aroma but i so many people will be like oh what's that smell and i'm like oh, it's home <laughs> it smells like home like i love that so i um yeah it's probably weird you know the they have those like those candles that are like grandma's kitchen or whatever state you, you're from or whatever part of the world, you know, different things. And they, they put in the different things. And I want like a rotten turtle grass smell again. <laughs> so I can smell home. Yeah. So anyway, strange thing. Once you're, once you're, you know, a uh, key soul, you're always a key soul, but, but yeah, so I do, I have that same experience. It's visual. It's, you know, the, the, all the senses, the smell, sight, sound, all of it. Yeah, yeah excellent. Uh, we're, we're almost running out of time. I, and I wanted to ask you so much, but, but, but I mean, there's too much to ask. Just back on the, on the conservation thing, um, and we talked roughly about the great changes that, that people see. Have you come across something that people don't see very much? you know, a part of the marine ecosystem that is now in real trouble, that is going to have a big impact, but it's not a thing we talk about. It's not a thing that, that's, that's sexy to talk about, to be advertised, to look at. It's funny you say sexy because it, my mind immediately went to, when you were at, it started to ask that question, um, to the, con just the, sea creature reproduction that uh my friend dr mara hart wrote sex in the sea which do i have it here oh i think it's over there anyway it's a really it's a great book it's very witty she's an excellent writer and it's super fun she also did a tedx talk which is fascinating but it was an education for me because all climate change and all of the impacts that that's having underwater and, you know, on top of that and then pollution and then all these different things that, you know, we see the plastic, we see the coral bleaching, we see all these things, but what we don't necessarily see is the way that, that all of this activity and all these changes are impacting the reproductive ability of sea creatures. And, you know, one of the she, Mara, Dr. Mara Hart, she's awesome. So she's a dear friend of mine, but she always, we're very similar in the sense that we always like lead with positive and really like, here are the problems, but like, let's get to the solutions. How can we, you know, how can we do better and how can we impact that and make and raise awareness and those types of things. And anyway, um, she, she had this, you know, thing. It's like, look, like nature wants to reproduce. Nature wants to, you know, be out there and have, you know, having sex and making new sea creatures so that it can, you know, keep going and, and um, live on. And I think that that's probably the thing that's not talked about a whole lot and is not readily available to just see, even as divers, you know, and, when we're down there like looking at it because it's such a i always describe her book as like it's the crazy and alien ways that sea creatures reproduce and it really is i mean some of it is like you wouldn't even see in the craziest sci-fi film ever you know but i i highly recommend it because i think as divers especially we can have such a we just have such a, a you we're positioned so uniquely to be stewards of where we love and where we you know enjoy and recreate and that book and her tedx talk which um you know it's sex in the sea and man it's amazing and i i would highly recommend it for divers and beyond and um and start talking about it start talking about fish sex this stuff is important because <laughs> otherwise we're not gonna have seafood huge protein source for the entire world and uh, you know m you know many people just really enjoy seafood and everything and it's become a way of life and and work and so much like that and and um there's a lot of elements of of climate change and the stuff like that going on that's impacting it very negatively so important it, topic it is and it and and 
size matters, you know, in that, yes. in that the size of fish and mammals and sea life that I see, um, I don't see anything big. I don't see anything that is of a good size for reproduction. So you go into a fish stall, walk through, everything is this size instead of this size. Mm -hmm. And you think, how are we expecting them all to reproduce? I mean, at the moment, we have um, a wonderful orca group that, uh, in, on the west coast of, of Scotland that come up and down. Uh, there's a, quite a, a, a good population there. But they're not breeding. Wow. They're, they're, because of the PCBs, plastic, everything else, um, reproduction is pretty, uh, in fact, I think it's non-existent now. I think they're doomed. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but I believe that's the case. So it's exactly what you're saying. It's those invisible things going wrong that, that are causing the main problems. Yeah, and it's, it's all the mechanisms, right? Because it's like this, nature is this finely tuned machine and all the gears and the cogs and all this stuff are working together and you get one out of joint and it like triggers this domino effect with everything else. And, you know, I, I think that's why it's really important as consumers to be aware and of the, of the issues, but also aware of how your choices with what seafood you're buying and eating impact, you know, and there's, um, the seafood watch app is really clever and updated pretty regularly. It's, um, it's through the Monterey sea aquarium out on the uh, West coast here. And it's, you know, it, it's an app, so it's worldwide, but it gives you like a really simple rating system of, of red, yellow, and green for your options, meaning just what you would expect, you know, like red, don't, it's a bad option, don't eat it. And then it tells you why. So it's not, um, it's not totally foolproof, like you can put in, and most of the time you can find specifically what seafood you're, you know, you're looking for, and it'll, you know, from region even, and it'll tell you why it's rated a certain way and it fluctuates and they update it. I think, God, I think they update it every day, but it's, um, or at least on a weekly basis. And it's interesting because often when it'll get either a yellow or a red rating of like, not a, not a good choice. It's because it's, it's detrimental to human health because of what's in that particular seafood or, uh, it also will happen because of the way it's caught. So you can really, you know, there's different ways like that. That's a great option um, to, to see how you're impacting it through that choice and actually even your own health, right? So, so that's a great thing. And, and uh, Mara, she works with Future of Fish. So there's some other organizations out there too that are going to have a lot of really great information on their websites if you want to do a deeper dive on that stuff. But um, I like to keep it really simple because then I think more people like myself included will then actually participate and do it. And the seafood app is a great way to just check in like, oh, this is salmon from here and it was caught this way and ask at restaurants because then people, you know, that own the restaurants and the, like they start getting it that we care and we're paying attention and we are wanting better options maybe than what you know, what was available or whatever. And anyway, it's a pretty clever system and it's super easy. So I think it's great for people to tap into that, especially as divers, because, you know, we, we don't want to, uh, you know, be the, the grouper, grouper sandwich diver, right? Where it's like, you know, you're ordering up the grouper and then complaining about not seeing any fish on your dive. But when we travel, the, you know, the impact that we have as tourists on the local area and, and the surrounding waters is, is real too and, and a big deal, you know? So just being real educated on as much as we can, that knowledge is, is again, the power. Absolutely. I, th I think we have a similar app here in the UK with the uh, Marine Conservation Society. It's, I think it's a similar sort of thing. So. Oh, um, great. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's, but again, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, thank you Likewise. very much again for, for taking the time. Best of luck with the new series. Uh, I really hope that takes off. Thank you. Yeah, can I tell people real quick um, to go yeah. check it out? Um, it's on YouTube. Just type in The Imperfect Conservationist. It'll pop up. Or you can use my name, Megan Haney Greer. And my website is meganhaneygreer.com. And I love 
all of the you know subscriptions tapping that bell to get the notifications and leaving comments and likes that all really helps me grow this project and I, like i said i want this to go far and wide i could use everybody's help to to spread the word and i just want this resource to go everywhere for sure and uh we'll put a link up to it on the end of this anyway as well thank you i really appreciate that i'll say goodbye for now and uh take care you too thanks for having me on bye now Thank you.